I can't tell you how much I love doing this show because I get the opportunity to talk to some of the smartest people in my network and from around the world. Today, I have a really great guest, somebody that was recommended to me by a client, and I started listening to his podcast, and I was really impressed by him and the work he's doing. Jaden Schaefer is my guest today, and if you're not familiar, Jaden is the host and the creator of the Chat GPT podcast, all about AI. I many times say that this is the number one AI podcast in the world. Jaden might argue with that. We're both pretty close in the rankings. We actually checked each other out and we're surprised at how similar our audience size is. I think mine's a little bit different. Uh, we are a little more executive focused on this and how AI is going to affect you and your business. Jaden, on the other hand, talks about general AI news and topics, but I found him to be a really fascinating guy. I was impressed, I did not know this coming in, with the ethical considerations that he's thinking about with AI philosophical considerations, how AI is going to change the world and our future. I'm so excited to bring you this episode. Jaden was such a great fun guest. He and I have just spent uh, about an hour and a half together and we've just set some time to grab a lunch and talk even more. I am excited for you to hear from Jaden Schaefer. Here it is. Well, welcome back to another edition of Convergence. I am so excited today to have a fellow AI uh, podcaster with me, Jaden Schaefer. I have been following Jaden's show uh, for uh, probably two or three months now, and I know a number of you have told me about his show as well because he's great at showing, giving you that that most updated recent news about what's happening in the world of ChatGPT and AI. And I was so fortunate to find out. He's pretty much a neighbor. I mean, we're about 10 minutes from each other. So we thought today would be a great time to come on the show together uh, and chat a little bit about the world of AI. Jaden, welcome to The Convergence. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to have you here because I'd love to first hear, how did you start? I mean, you got the best name for a show you possibly could in the world of ChatGPT. When your show is named ChatGPT, <laughs> you had to be pretty early on in this thing, right? <laughs> Yeah, um, pretty much the reason I, I got started with the show and and really interested in it is uh, I've been in software for a while, um, doing different software companies, and when and I've been pushing. I have this buddy that he's an incredible, phenomenal developer, and I've been pushing him. I'm like, man, we got to do an AI business, and we were exploring all these different AI businesses and looking at them, and then ChatGPT drops, um, and all of a sudden, like all of these ideas we had were like, oh my gosh, they're so possible, so feasible. Um, so we got started with it and we started talking to people and they're like, hey, you know, if you're going to start like a, if you're going to start a company inside of AI, it's a hot area right now. You really need to like find a, a medium or like a, some sort of channel that you're like excelling at. And so like, you know, go get famous on Twitter or something. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's just not really my like vibe <laughs> as much. Like I try, you know, but so anyways, I've done podcasting in the past. I'm, I, yeah. I love it. It's super fun. I've done like YouTube and that kind of stuff. And so. Um, yeah, I was just originally starting it to kind of start sharing some of the cool insights I saw within ChatGPT and what was happening in the field, and then also to kind of start building an audience um, for this software company that I'm, you know, it's in stealth mode right now, but uh, currently yeah. building. And um, then it just really exploded. Like as you can as you can see with everything that's happening right now, uh, it just went absolutely crazy. And so then I started taking it more seriously, and it's been a really fun ride. Well, I have to tell you, I think I think your name came up first time in conversation to me because I told somebody, I said, I think I have the top AI podcast in the world because I was looking at my numbers and they were like, are you sure? Because there's this other guy and I, I looked up, I'm like, son of a gun, he might have the top one because <laughs> like, no, there's really no way to know in podcasting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, you, you, just, sort of, you just sort of claim the space that you want. I'm right, like, right. Hey, it's okay, we can both be number one. I'll definitely <laughs> we'll, keep we're... claiming it forever. <laughs> <laughs> we'll share the number one spot. But I thought it was really fascinating fascinating the way you've done this too, because I think what's very different, and, and for those of you listening to this show right now, you know, I, I know here sitting as somebody tells you to subscribe to my podcast, I'm going to tell you to subscribe to, to Jaden's. And that's just because it's so fresh, right? right? I mean, you're publishing every day. I'm, yeah. I'm publishing once a week. We tried twice a week and it almost killed me. Um, maybe <laughs> well, it's because I don't have podcasts. the technical skills. <laughs> that's, so. true. that's true. I do have a number of shows too. So that, but that's a, that's a pretty heavy frequency. So how do you, how do you find time to do that? Like how, how does that work into your schedule? Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, it's, it's hard because like, 
I, I wouldn't say like, you know, I am a podcaster. Like that's not my main thing. Like my main thing is like, I'm trying yeah. to do this, this, you know, software startup. I'm like, you know, up to my, uh, up to my chin and like working <laughs> with developers and designers and all this kind of stuff. Um, for me, the podcast honestly is kind of like a, a way to, I have to stay on top of everything that's happening in yeah. AI because of my company. And so for me, it's almost like a way to just kind of like chill out at the end of the day. I go, I read like all the top articles. I have some newsletters I've subscribed to that give me AI news. I kind of digest it all. And then I just flick on the mic and uh, just freestyle for 20 minutes covering um, everything that's happening in the AI news that day. And then, you know, my insights. And it's kind of cool because I'm sure you see this, but like the longer you're in a niche and in a space, like when I'm looking at top AI news every single day, uh, my understanding gets a lot a lot broader and I start like chaining together like, oh my gosh, this like thing that Facebook came out with today completely connects with this other project that is going to, that, you know, is uh, supposed to launch next year. And so it's going to be like this insane, you know, event that's going to happen. So then you start kind of putting stuff together. Whereas if it was, um, you know, if I wasn't like super on top of it, it would be really hard to have some of those insights and and see exactly what's like happening on at the cutting edge. That's so true. And I, and I really appreciate that because it's very difficult when you try to piecemeal things together to understand where, what the pattern is, right? I think pattern right. recognition is something we as human beings do really, really well. People that know me from my other work know that that's what I'm an expert at. I can walk into businesses and find these obscure patterns and help companies find ways to improve upon those. But I, I love that idea. And I, and I know it's really true with me. I've even started to post some videos as of recently you know, trying to connect the dots between announcements. And unfortunately, I don't have, I'm not spending as much time. I just got to listen to every one of your, po- to like make it a religious experience <laughs> that every morning I get on the rowing machine and I listen, to, I listen to Jaden's podcast because it is really true when the more information you have, the more uh, that you can predict where this is going. Yeah. And the more that you can extrapolate on where the opportunities are. I also have an AI company. I haven't even announced this yet on the show. I also have an AI company oh, in stealth cool. mode, primarily because I was watching things happening and I said, well, wait a second, two plus two equals four. Why is nobody else adding these two numbers up? And I kept looking and looking and I'm like, at some point, somebody's going to figure this out. And I'm like, they haven't figured it out. So yep. what? why don't I just be the person that does it? And then what I did, and I think this is so important in any time that you're doing a startup is... I essentially went to other people that were smarter than I than I am and had better resources and networks in that area and brought them in as investors. Mm. So, you know, so, so now it's not just, I, I showed them and I said, what do you think of this trend? And they were like, that's something we can get into. And I'm like, well, here's my idea. And they're like, here's my check. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, no, 100%. so that is a really important thing I think to be able to do is, is to be able to extrapolate upon that uh, in order to find these niches that are going to be out there that, that need to be, you know, somebody needs to jump in on. Yeah. hundred um, percent. So what if, when did you start your podcast? What, what month did you launch? Um, you know, I think I wanted to see more credible. So I realized that with Spotify for podcasters, you can back schedule podcasts. So I think I, I started dropping a bunch in December, but in reality it was probably, <laughs> uh, February or something. I, so I'm, if I want to be the first and number one, I need to go into Spotify and backdate some stuff for like November. Yeah, it's a, then... I know this is crazy. I don't know how interesting people will be about this, but uh, I had a podcast at one point that was done by AI and it was AI written and then AI recorded. And I had a VA that was in charge of scheduling. And they made this mistake one day where instead of, I told them schedule a podcast every day this month and they accidentally did it the month before. So inadvertently it was like 30 episodes all went live on one day. And the next day when I saw that, I was like, you know, super annoyed. I'm like, Hey, what the heck? But I looked at it and the numbers for the podcast just like exploded. Yes. It went from like zero to like a million, right? Or not really, but it was something really yeah, crazy, I know what you mean. abnormal. And, uh, Anyways, then I was like, what? You can retroactively schedule. And I guess it's, I guess it's if you're moving from one podcast platform right, to, to another, platform. you can, yeah. you know, you're like, oh, I want to get all my old episodes up. And so you can do that. But anyways, yeah, it was kind of funny. So I, I believe I did that, but really it was probably February that I, <laughs> I got serious about it. And listen, I got to tell you that there is a strategy to that because the reality is a, somebody that launches shows every couple months for clients, it's very, very hard to get traction on the first couple shows because one listener is only one episode download. Yeah. But when you have a hundred episodes and somebody says, Oh, I'm going to just download all of them. Well, then that's a hundred <laughs> views yeah. versus one. So you end up, your numbers get way better, the bigger that you become. And that's the reason yeah. that guys like Joe Rogan can have 
you know, 10 million, you know, downloads because people want to go back and find the old episodes. And so that's really fascinating. So, so let's talk a little bit about, um, AI in general, and what do you believe that, you know, where do you see the market going? A lot of the last probably two months, we've been talking a lot about AI on this show, and we've tried to get into the philosophical aspects of it, as well as the ethical aspects of it, try mm-hmm. to talk a little bit more about singularity. So let's maybe go down the rabbit hole a little bit. <laughs> Instead of talking about where AI is today, maybe let's talk about where it is and I know five years in the world of AI could be like 500 years uh, yeah. in, in the real world. But where do you see the trend line going? Like what, okay. what do you see as the future? Well, so like corp- okay, I have two interesting insights for you. One is like Great. corporate where it's going. And then one is just like the apocalyptic nightmare that I, don't, that, sure. that is, uh, I believe, coming faster than a lot of people know. Um, okay. So, no, and of course, this is coming from a guy that has a, a you know, AI startup. Um, yeah. that will like massively push AI forward. But so I'm very <laughs> bullish on AI, but like this is, there's some concerns to definitely be aware of. So number one, corporate, I think um, most CEOs that I've heard talk, uh, Airbnb, Uber, a bunch of these guys, they said AI in this year, in the next, you know, 365 days mm-hmm. will um, make their company 30% more productive. Or so uh, there's a 30% productivity boost right off the bat today. Just what, yeah. what's available today, that's what's happening. Where I believe this goes in the future um, is I believe that it's not going to be, you know, like people lay off their whole work because eventually that 30% turns to 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. I don't believe that uh, the workforce will all be laid off. I believe companies will just um, have all of their current employees 90 times, you know, 10 times more productive yes. and will potentially reap 10 times as many profits. And um, not to say that a company that integrates AI is just uh, because of that going to be successful. But I believe the companies that do not integrate AI will 100% fail and they'll 100% get eaten and beaten by uh, companies that do. So that's the corporate uh, vision yeah. that I see. And I mean, I let think- me stop you on that for a second, because yeah. I think, isn't that fascinating? So AI is going to kill jobs, but it's not going to kill jobs. The AI itself is not going to kill jobs. It's the companies that don't adopt the AI yeah. that are going to be killed. Those are the jobs that are going to be killed. Yeah. So if you're working for an organization right now that's being proactive and thinking about these things and saying, hey, how do we integrate this? How do we augment? What are the use cases? Jamie Morgan from Chase just recently announced that Chase Bank has 300 written use cases of how AI is going to change their business. And they are segmenting out small populations of their workforce. Maybe it's one or two people in a call center. And they're saying, we're gonna augment these people with AI. And we're gonna stand here with a stopwatch and we're gonna track how long does it take them to do stuff? How long does it take the other guy to do stuff? And if we find opportunities, then we will integrate those opportunities you know, globally. Yep. But they're not saying, you know, shut down the call center and and let's replace it with AI. No, no, no. They're saying, let's figure this out in a, in a little vacuum and, and let's make improvements. And let's, uh, you people know my, my phraseology. I always say automate, outsource, abbreviate, eliminate. I've been saying that for 30 years. That's what I do, right? It's the same exact thing here. Get, get it to work in a vacuum, expand it out. But the key there is having those use cases written out, well thought through, strategized in a drawer someplace that says, when an AI can do this, we're going to be one of the first companies that test that. And I think, Jaden, if you take that, if you're a, a CEO listening to this show, if you take that leadership position and you uh, you start to have these conversations with your people now, your people will be excited about AI coming in versus afraid. Because yeah. most of what they're hearing on the news right now is 80% of jobs are going to be gone by next year. And they're like, wait, what? Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. I mean, so, so I love where you're going with that. I think it's really about, and I'm going to, you're going to hear me talk about that a lot more. It's not about AI stealing jobs. It's about the people that don't adopt AI that are going to lose their jobs. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, you think about it. It's like, I'm sure when the dishwasher was invented, you know, the dishwasher's union and went on strike or whatever and complained that, you know, the job <clears throat> being getting taken. But in reality, what that means is just one person manages the dishwasher machine and uh, you could franchise or you could serve twice as many customers now or whatever it is, right? So I think that uh, that's what happens to companies. If you adopt it, they'll expand. Some will not adopt it. They will shrink. Um, and ultimately, I believe the global standard of living will rise 
as a result. It's it's not like, you know, everyone gets laid off and the world ends. It's just like, no, we can make things faster and cheaper. And anytime mm -hmm. the, the entire economy can build things faster and cheaper, um, everyone's global point. standard of living increases. I love that. And I, I'm going to give a little plug for my own, my last book here called Adapt Agility that was named by ChatGPT, by the way. I had it read the book and then it came up with the title and the whole, you know, subtitle nice. and all those kind of things. But the first part of that book talks about how the firemen in New York City worked uh, in the early 1800s. And that was that they had wagons that they pulled through the streets by themselves and volunteers could, could come out and help pull these wagons through the streets. And it wasn't when, when they decided to bring in horses, the union struck, they struck, they walked out. The, the mm -hmm. firemen were like, how dare you bring in automation to this industry? You know, we have all this great history of dragging all this equipment through the streets. <laughs> horses, you know, that, that seems like sacrilegious. And, and they walked out on the job. Therefore, New York City could bring the horses in because the guys walked. They're like, it'll right, never work. Right. What do you yeah. think? A horse can pull a wagon? What are you guys, idiots? It's like... <laughs> So, so it is really interesting. And I think you're so right. We can look at this with the loom. We can look at this with the printing press. None of these things eliminated completely that industry. Even with horses, I had some friends here the other day and, uh, and they, they do dressage, you know, you gotta be pretty wealthy to get into that kind of horses. And I said, uh -huh. isn't it funny that 200 years ago, every poor person owned a horse. Now the only people that have horses are yeah. super rich people. <laughs> so it goes to show how those things will elevate, I believe, you yeah. know, you'll see that with music. You'll see that with literature. I've talked a lot about this where content is not literature. You know, when you look back at Poe or any of these great novelists, sometimes it would take them three or four years to write an article because yeah. they thought about every single word and they tried to understand the visuals that were happening in people's heads. Hey, I can't do that. But it, mm -hmm. what it can do is mass produce the, co the lowest common denominator. Mm -hmm. So I love what you're saying here. We're definitely right in line. So there is the corporate influence. Now let's yeah. talk a little bit about the future, your second part. Oh, the future that I think about that I think everyone should be aware about. Like I hate to be an alarmist or whatever, but I really think everyone should everyone should think about this because um, I believe inevitably this is coming is um, the combination of AI, which as you know, like everyone's been seeing how fast this thing has been advancing and progressing. Yep. So look at that rate of progress. I don't think that will, I, I believe it will continue to, you know, there might be speed bumps and whatever. Um, some sure. people say like GPT-4 is maxed out as far as the transformer model goes, whatever. AI will continue to advance at a rate that uh, it's quite intelligent and very fast. And inevitably, I believe where this goes is, um, the combination of AI augmenting literally into our brains with Neuralink and other devices like that, which in my opinion is terrifying and I, th you know, kind of horrifying, but like, I know it's going there. Um, and I think that it is an area that people should talk about and think about and um, beyond exciting, just, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's crazy. Right. But like, think about it. Um, every, everyone that has like people with disabilities, there's recently just an incredible story. I don't know if you saw, but, um, there's a guy in, in uh, Switzerland, some researchers in Switzerland, and I think they got a guy in France, and he got in a motorcycle accident, paralyzed from the waist down, and they have helped him to walk again using AI. So um, essentially what they do is they have a chip stuck in his brain, right? And this is another thing I think people should be aware of, but it's AI can read your mind, literally. Yes. Uh, yeah. So that's crazy, right? So they stick you under an fMRI scanner, they MRI, scan your brain... Yeah your brain waves while you read something, they feed the brain waves and the script of what you read into a neural network side by side. And then the neural network can say, right, they read this word, this is how their brain, uh, their brain pulses or whatever. Anyways, and then they, they use that to create an AI that can just like, look at your mind, an fMRI scan, and it can literally word for word, it's not perfect, but like, high accuracy word for word, say what you're thinking. To me, that's, you know, that's terrifying for a lot of different reasons. I don't um, know if you saw there was one where they were doing video based. They could even then yeah, turn into yeah, images. It's yeah, like, I hate that. Like, wow. Like whole you could literally video out of my mind. Like get out of here. It's so, <sighs> yeah, it feels which, uh, which then brings, I don't want to interrupt your flow, but I posted no, no. something on this the other day that the show extrapolations on Apple TV, you know, episode two is really fascinating because it's 20 years in the future where we've been able to now do that with all the animals on the planet. And we can Ooh, speak directly man, to the animals. I did not even think of that implication. Oh, ah, right? And, and, and then what does that do for our ethics when the cow 
being led into the slaughterhouse <laughs> is calling out, hey, bro, no. not for me. That, that changes things dramatically yeah, sure. from our perspective. And it's interesting, that episode, if anybody wants to go check it out, it's really interesting how we still become humans, where we're feeding things, we're telling these animals things that are just total lies, <laughs> right? In order to try to manipulate them. And it's like, wow, why would we, how would we do that? And they're like, yeah, that's pretty much exactly what we would do as a species. We're, right. We're sort of notorious for that as a species. Right. But, but I think that's the next place is because if you can create a Rosetta Stone of animal, uh, the, the ways that animal are, are thinking. And listen, I don't think animals are thinking in words in their mind. Yeah, yeah. But they're somehow, built, they have a mental model of the world. Yeah. They have some level of consciousness uh, that, you know, they have some, you know, all of these different things going on. If we can figure that out, that's going to be a, that's probably going to be the biggest ethical dilemma of our time. And how much do you think someone would pay to be able to talk to their dog? Like, I'd pay a you know, that industry is going to be massive. <laughs> right. Like, holy smokes. So I just think that there's a lot coming with that. And that is, yeah. uh, you know, that that's going to change the way that we look at the world. Um, uh, you know, and, and I think it's, it is always important to remember that anything, any technology, any advance, any moral changes in our society is it's difficult to judge the people of the past based upon our moral standards of today. So oh, 25 years from now, when somebody's listening to this and saying, you know, back in those old days when they used to eat animals and then <laughs> the animals spoke up and we're like, right, this is sort yeah. of BS, bro. Like, yeah. it's hard to judge us on something we don't know. Oh right? yeah, 100%. There, there is, like, I think there's a thought experiment that if aliens came down today and looked at society like what would they find shocking that we just find like normal there's just gonna be a million things right like mm -hmm. i think about like if society was set up on like a hundred planets and then let run for like a thousand years where each of those societies would be like it there is there is no way that any of those like remotely have um all the same beliefs and all the same thoughts and all the same ways of doing things you know what i mean so yeah. Yeah, it's really, it's very, very true. I mean, we do tend to assign agency to things that we don't understand. And that has built a lot of our society. And the more that we understand, the more difficult it becomes for us and the more ethical dilemmas that we run into. I mean, you know, just look at the fact that, you know, we have to remember a few hundred years ago, slavery was like a common thing. Right. Now it's an appalling thing to us. So I, I, I love thinking about the philosophical and the ethical, you know, dilemmas. I, I, I just to give, go off topic for a moment. Yeah, yeah. Anybody who's listened to the episodes with Des Rock, who's been on the show a couple of times, Des is like one of the top hackers in the world. She's now turned white hat. Uh, so she's actually working on behalf of companies. But one of the things that she said one day on the show, and it just, just like blew my mind is, is she was talking about cybersecurity and she said, you know, people think that hackers are unethical. And she said, but I will tell you that if you as a hacker were to go in the front door and let's think about, uh, you know, a business, a bank or whatever it is. Uh, she said the, that most executives are focused on protecting the front door, the really obvious mm. stuff. They don't think about all the side doors, but she said, I'm just going to tell you if you as a hacker ex went in the front door of a bank and exploited something, the hacking community would destroy you. They would literally make it so that you couldn't live on this planet anymore. She's like, cause that's considered unethical to a hacker. <laughs> you have to exploit something that nobody else found. That's okay. <laughs> on a moral standard, that's the high, that's like Jesus, right? She's that's like, funny. But, to, but to walk through the front door and steal something, you're a thief, even though that, even though they both stole. Right, <laughs> I mean, right. I mean, Wait, what? Even though they both stole the same information, one did it too easily and is therefore banned from the community and the other one did it the hard way. And because they did it the hard way, they're celebrated as a hero. It's like, uh, okay, like we have to right. think through those moral implications of this kind of stuff because our children and our children's children will look back upon us and they will say, what the heck were they thinking? <laughs> you know, yeah. to your point with the hundred different planets. No, yeah. So and go ahead, please. Oh, no, yeah. So I mean- it is crazy. It's hard to judge people from the past. And likewise, like I know for a fact in a hundred years, people will judge 
whatever I say. And anyone listening, lest you think like I'm the only one, you're all getting judged too, I promise. So, <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the worst though? I mean, it's like you think you're in the highest ethical moral standard as you sit and you say, you know, I'm, I'm the good. I love there's this skit on YouTube. If anybody hasn't seen it, it's called Are We the Baddies? And it was like this thing done on the BBC years ago. And it's like these military guys in a trench and they have like uniforms on and stuff. And, and the one is saying to the other one, he's like, um, you know, do you ever think that maybe like we're the bad guys? And he's like, oh, there's no possible way. And he's like, yeah, but like our emblem is like a skull. And he's like, like <laughs> what, what good guys would have a skull, right? He's like, oh yeah, I guess. And like all of a sudden they both, it dawns on them both. They're like, and, and it's obvious that it's a playoff, the Nazis. And they're like, yeah, yeah. wait. We're the bad guys? Like, we thought we were the good guys. Like, what is going on? Right? They had That's this whole, funny. Their whole yeah. world was turned upside down. And I think those are the kind of things that we have to, we have to, you know, be conscious of and understand. And I think those things have to somewhat go into our, you know, decision making. But, but again, it's hard, you know, when, when the animals can't talk yet, <laughs> we're still, we still can take the moral high ground mm -hmm. when they can talk, the moral high ground might change significantly. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's, it's tricky too, because like when you're looking at AI and everything happening right now, like, you know, some people, Elon Musk, right. Said like, let's slow it down for six months. I mean, then he went and started an AI startup. So, I mean, I don't know, yeah. but, um, but uh, yeah, you like you see people in in retrospect, it's easy to it's easy to judge. But like right in the moment, there's a lot of reasons why these AI companies and other people can justify a lot of the things they're doing. I mean, even talking about Neuralink, which I think is moving towards a dystopian end. Like I just saw a, a report on a similar technology literally making a man that couldn't walk for the last 20 years walk again. And when they pulled him off the yeah. system, he can still walk a little bit. Like it's like mind blowing. He's paralyzed from the waist. He was paralyzed from the waist down. And essentially what they do is they they put some things into his uh, like spine that made electrical yeah. pulses. And so when he thinks like right leg move, it would like electrical pulse the muscle that would help move his right leg and left leg. And uh, it's going through a neural network. So he has this whole backpack with a computer on that's got a neural network like decoding his thoughts and sending them to the paddles and the electric shocks. And it's like crazy. And I'm like, how could yeah. I ever say like take that away from that guy? Because know, you know, I don't right? like where that goes if society all starts putting chips in their brain. Like, so well, I yeah. Wanna, I wanna yeah, I wanna talk about this a little bit. I wanna I wanna recommend a book too. There's a book called The Experience Machine that's out right now. There's even a couple of TikTok channels that are just devoted to this one book. This guy's like a neuroscientist, and he has found that things like pain, more often than not, they're memories of pain. They aren't actually real. So it goes back to what you were just saying. Like once the brain has been trained upon something, it doesn't really forget. So he was talking about like people with back pain. If people have had a serious back injury, the next time they even just twist themselves the wrong way, they'll feel in their brain all of this pain, even really? though when you measure the sense, it's like it's not happening. And they've yeah. halluc they're hallucinating the pain because it's associated with this previous pain event, which goes to what you're saying with this guy in a positive sense of, you know, he, he, his brain was stimulated to be able to walk. And now his brain is like, well, I know I can. So I, let me just do it. Yeah. Uh, now here's my, here's my real question for you though, because if Neuralink was available tomorrow, I would get it. You and, would, and here's why. You're a maniac. Here's why. I know. But I'm going to tell you that I think the difference is this. Right now, if I put this to my head, the difference between this and Neuralink is about three millimeters. Like all I'm doing right, I, ha I already have Neuralink. It's just here, <laughs> right? So we're not talking, people are saying, oh, it's this huge jump to go to putting something inside your head. No, it's only actually technically, I've got a scalpel here, <laughs> a couple of millimeters and I could get there. So what we're actually talking about from an ethical perspective is something being inside of you and becoming part of your autonomy and being you not being autonomous, but you being augmented or me being able to sit the device down. That's really the only thing that's yeah. different. Okay. Here's, here's another thought for you <laughs> because I, I get what you're saying. There's three different ways. I use Neuralink because it's a fun boogeyman. It's like, you want to stick yeah, like a chip right. in oh, your totally. brain. Um, there's three ways that you can achieve that though. Number one, Neuralink, which is literally, uh, it's physically embedded into your, into your brain. It's kind of like acupuncture, very small needles, yeah. but they're in your brain. Um, measuring electrical pulses. Number two, um, there's another company that's doing one. It's more like saran wrap. So it's like a layer that they put on top of your brain. It's a little bit less invasive. Um, and then number three is the 
the new AI trained models that are fMRI scanners, which can be external. Now it's like, okay, well, an fMRI scanner is this massive machine to get underneath of it. Like how's, what's the uh, viability of that? This is the one other thing I do want to bring up is that is going to shrink and it is going to be around everyone's heads and it's going to be a VR headset. And uh, ah. yeah, so get that. Every VR headset will have an fMRI scanner on it that will read your mind. And who's the number one company with VR headsets right now? Facebook's Oculus. Therefore, if you didn't like Facebook seeing everything you click on on your Facebook feed and advertising to you targeted on that, imagine Facebook reading your mind on a In daily basis head. whenever you pop your VR headset on. So I don't know if you know this, but I actually uh, was the COO of an early VR company in 2015. We launched the first metaverse called Hypatia. Okay. And I had a chance to meet with Palmer Lucky and a couple of those guys early nice. on in that Oculus process. Very cool, very cool. And I'm let me tell you, Palmer. even... Yeah, he's 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 an amazing guy. And let me tell you that even what we're seeing today in VR headsets, I have one. Where's it at? It's on my uh, it's on my uh, there it is. It's it's on my giraffe's head right now. Nice. Um, but but I will tell you that even what we're seeing today, the stuff that Palmer was showing us eight years ago, was way better <laughs> than what you're seeing so you today. Know it. Oh yeah, than what uh, you're seeing that today. That annoys but me. But then man. again. <laughs> that was running off, I mean, probably mainframe computers, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you were yeah. literally plugged in. But I, we did one thing with him. It was really fascinating. They, they showed us the scene from the movie The Hobbit where he has the cloak of invisibility and he's in the dragon's den. And the dragon is, he's invisible. So the dragon is trying to smell him. And literally this, this nose of this dragon is right here. And it's breathing and you can hear the breath and you can hear all these things. And, uh, and then the dragon turns around and says, I can't see you, but I can smell you. And it turns back and it blasts all these flames across the scene. And the interesting thing was afterwards, you take the headset off and they showed you your skin temperature. And the weird thing was, was that when the dragon was breathing, you could see that the heat signature was on your face, like your, it was getting, and then when it blew across, like you, were, I took mine off. I was literally like dripping in sweat. So my brain convinced me that there was a ch change in temperature even without that. Oh my so there's gosh. that, right? I don't know if you've seen Magic Leap and some of the stuff. Magic Leap yeah. has never really gotten traction, but it is a I mean, I saw one, right? that. What's or the that? Microsoft one was it? Yeah. Well, Magic Leap. I don't. I think Microsoft has them now. They were originally standalone, okay. and back then they were using uh, a laser. They were using so these glasses. Like a that's more like corporate or military, right? Yeah, they, they've really made the move, right? The immersive, photorealistic, ray tracing, digital twins in the omniverse. Yeah, so it's, they super, yeah, this is what they do is they superimpose over the real world. Yeah, yeah. But I had seen it maybe seven or eight years ago. And back then, the easiest way to explain it was, they've been around for 15 years. The, the easiest way to explain it is they put these glasses on you that use lasers to shoot images into your retina that would appear in the real world. So they were, they were actually like hijacking your, your, your mm. vision and projecting images inside your head that were, they were using the retina to bounce them off. But they did one where you, it was like, you were sitting in a room and this elephant just like burst through the door and like smashed all this stuff. And it, you think it's in the real world. Wow, because crazy. it's AR. So it's just crazy where this stuff is going. Um, but you're not optimistic. So, so let me ask you this. I'm going to ask you the ethical question first. I'll put it in my head. I'm happy. Okay. Elon, if you're listening. I'm, we I'm have, up, man. Just, <laughs> we have I, a first test be, subject. I will be the first test subject. But so you believe that, that they will have the, M, the fMRI scanner. They've got this saran wrap version. Where, where is the line for you? Would you don't want to take Neuralink, but would you put the saran wrap on your head? <laughs> no, I mean, I don't like any of them. And you know what the thing is, like how the you know conspiracy theorists are tinfoil hat people. Mm -hmm. There will be like literally people that wear some version of metal on their head because when you go out into public, like when you go through the airport security scan thing right now, that thing is going to read your mind when you walk in. Like. They're going to say, oh. are you a terrorist? And then it just like scans your brain. Every like they just pull a video out. Like, have you engaged in any terrorist activity? Pulls the video out of your brain that immediately comes to your mind when you think about it. So like, oh, 
but it's going to happen. Uh, resist if you want. It's going to happen. And uh, Well, what's the old saying? Resistance is futile. Yeah. I think I, I wanted to bring up uh, Kevin Myers has been on this show from AI Advertising and they're an ad agency that use, has been using AI for like six or seven years. These massive data lakes of every buying bit of buying information, all those kind of things. It's mm -hmm. interesting because I asked him on the show, I said, you know, um, is Alexa and Facebook listening? And he said, it wouldn't matter. He said, I, we already know so much about you that I yeah. can predict when you're going to buy your next mattress. I know the month and the year you're going to buy your next car. I know all of these things because we have so much data on you to begin with. One of the mm -hmm. things that he said in that episode, which still to this day, I repeat it every day, is that Mer Americans have the illusion of privacy. Mm. We believe that there is still some semblance of privacy. The reason that I'm concerned about the Chinese and their approach to AI is they don't. Mm. Like everybody knows everything that you do is being mm -hmm. tracked. Every time you open, I mean, to that point, they're putting chips now in refrigerators. Every time you open the door, every time you close it, it knows all of this information about human activities that we as Americans are just resisting mm -hmm. um, and saying, no, 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 no. We need our privacy. We need our privacy. So that means that the companies have to give us the illusion of privacy even right. though we don't have any of it at all. So I do wonder how do we get over that, right? We gotta, we gotta get, we've gotta get to this point. I don't know. Is resistance futile or do we just stop resistance? Well, okay. So here's the thing. More? I went down a pretty deep rabbit hole recently <laughs> okay. um, on like mind reading tech and like how it works. Okay. Cause I was like, holy smoke. It was just like mind blowing. And what I found out is that the Chinese have been using different mind reading, mind reading, but it wasn't actually yep. that back then. They've been using different AI where essentially they would take you and they would stick you in like a glass box. And, you know, it's like kind of the difference between um, a Tesla. When a Tesla drives, Elon's like, we don't need the LiDAR and radar and stuff. We just have cameras yep. on the Tesla and it can just drive because it has the image neural network. China went sure. a similar approach with their mind reading AI where essentially they would make you watch Chinese propaganda movies um, and then they had cameras watching you and they could like look at your, they could like look at your eye movements. They could look at your heat from your body temperature. They could look at your facial expressions if like any muscles twitch. Anyways, they had this AI and it could pretty much detect when you watch Chinese, prom, uh, Chinese communist propaganda, if you agreed with it or not. So they could determine how much education you needed to make sure you agreed with it. Right. So that was like their first step. That was in 2019. But inevitably since then, they don't need that anymore because now they literally just stick you in a box and then they are able to just like look at your exact thoughts and know, do you believe? Do you agree? And uh, that. So that's one side of it. And again, a lot of people bring up the whole thing about like an fMRI scanner is this big, huge device, yada, yada. Of course, we know it will shrink down. And my final thing to say about, um, you know, the, the viability of this being a mainstream yeah. tool 100% Facebook in one of their most recent um, meta, in one of their most recent projects they announced, it is a multi-sensory AI training tool. Essentially what it does is when you as a person are walking down the street in New York, you're not just looking and seeing things to train or hearing like an audio. You have like a, all these senses and you're combining them to train and see how you believe in things mm -hmm. and how you see things. So they created a multi-sensory AI that essentially like took in the room temperature. It took in the audio sounds. It took in the visuals. It took in like the sounds and all these different senses and it uses it to train. Now their idea with it is to make the most ultra realistic VR experiences. And so mm -hmm. they open source this, but that's where they're going. But buried inside of the announcement of that like AI tool, they had a list of like, you know, this is, AI is going to be way better. And these experiences are going to be way better when we're collecting data on like, you know, room temperature and audio and like all these things. And in there they said, an fMRI inputs. Oh. Mic drop. They are 100% so <laughs> gonna stick that in their headset. Just 100%. So like you said, what's the ethical implications? How do we get over it? Uh, the yeah. Chinese, they're going full steam and you know reading their citizens' minds and making them watch their propaganda. So like there's that. What happens in America? Which gives them an advantage, right? I mean, it, in a lot of senses, it could give them a very serious advantage. Um, it is interesting. I want to talk about one thing. I mentioned this book, The Experience Machine. Uh, it's interesting, and I, and I know I'm going to fudge it up, but the way that he explains it is that the human mind, and this we have to think about this when it comes to VR or, VR or AI, because it is based upon human 
you know, interactions. It's reading yeah. human information. But what he had found was that the visual cues that we take on a daily basis when we look at our screens or we look at another person, those come into our brain and they're processed and those signals go out and, and that's how we interact with the world. We know to reach our hand out. We know to, you know, to say something. We know how to react to all these things. Yeah. But what he found, and I might screw up the numbers, but I think it's right, is he said for every one piece of data, every one data point that comes in visually, there are five pieces of data that get sent out to the extremities. And he said okay. essentially what we're finding is that 80% of what we the 80% of the information that we use to interpret the world is not coming from our senses. It is in our brains from previous interactions, mm. right? It's no, no. And the way he explained it was this, which I thought was really cool. As he said, you're, you're driving down a, a, a back road out in the country and there's only one radio station on. And, and the song is, you know, something that somebody my age would know, pour some sugar on me by Def Leppard. And mm -hmm. it's really staticky. But I can get like every 10th or 15th little tiny snippet of it. Mm -hmm. But my brain reconstructs that whole thing. Yeah. I can sing right along with it, even though I'm only catching these little intervals. And he uses a couple different in the in the audiobook, it's really interesting. He plays some sounds and he plays ones where it's just the sound of beeps. Mm -hmm. And then he has somebody say words over the beeps and then play the beeps again. And you can't hear the beeps the next time. Like mm. you, your brain, your brain connected it to that it was language. And it immediately tried then to interpret it as language, which is which is sort of fascinating. And I wonder if it puts a limitation on AI because it's essentially saying that the inputs are only 20% of what affects the actual output and outcome because it's it's all these learned experiences that have been stored there in that neural network. Uh, and are processed accordingly based upon the current situation. And this is what he talked about, like surprise. He said, you know, if you're driving down a road and a deer jumps in front of you, many times, you know, I I've done this. I've my wife and I drove across the country one time and we had an argument about who drove through Tennessee. And we were like, neither of us could remember the whole entire state of Tennessee. It's like, <laughs> I don't remember any of the roads. Like, you know what I mean? You get into yeah. that sort of zombified mode, and it isn't until the deer jumps out. That you that anything even starts to process. So I do wonder: do, is it a secret sauce that we have, or is that just a database? Right, and right. it's just is AI doing the same thing? I, I I just I just think it's interesting as I just learned about it, and I'm like, huh, how does that play into this whole conversation? Yeah, yeah, no, I, that definitely is very interesting. Um, so much about our perception about everything around us is yeah based off of our experiences and people that have the same experience could have two different perception of perceptions of like what's happening and stuff so it is interesting how ai would would play into that um i think perhaps ai uh offers a i don't want to say unbiased because I'll, at, to this point i have not seen I'm an serious. ai that hasn't been able to find a bias that hasn't had a bias but um it, you know like theoretically i know a lot of people will argue about this because, you know, ChatGPT has its problems. But theoretically, if you came to ChatGPT or an AI model that had a whole bunch of data put into it and um, you asked it, you know, what what is what is the answer to this based off of the data that you have? Um, and no human touches that or puts the boilerplate like answer that ChatGPT has, you know, like answers that yeah. their, some of their developers put on there for some sorts of questions. Like theoretically, I would like to think that it would just like based off all this data, this is the truth, right? Maybe we get like better at not hallucinating and stuff. And so yeah. maybe AI does bring us to a point where we can be more um, objective with uh, with information than, you know, like there's all these different debates in America. We have, you know, different political beliefs and religious beliefs mm -hmm. and um, ideological beliefs. And a lot of things are emotionally charged. And there's a lot yes. of uh, corporations that are seriously financially incentivized yeah. to keep us emotionally charged about different yeah. topics. So I would like to think that perhaps AI would be able to uh, eventually offer a solution to have more objective outcomes and answers to questions. I think you and I are on the same page. I, I said this recently. I don't even think that episode's dropped yet, but we talked about things like healthcare and we said may maybe having a objective third party that is only looking at quantitative data 
maybe what it does to our healthcare system is make it significantly better. Now that doesn't mm. mean it'll make it significant, significantly better for each individual. It might make it a lot worse mm. for the end of, for an individual, but it could make it a lot better for everyone else. There's a, there's a great book um, out now called against empathy. And one of the things that he talks about in that book is this, he talks about it and, and I'm going to botch the experiment. I, I, maybe I'll try to do a video specific on it, but he sends, essentially says, if we give a list of the people on a kidney transplant list, if we give the, ten, the, the, the top 10 people that are waiting on a kidney transplant, whose life depends upon it. And then we show you a video of a story of a little girl, three or four years old, um, and, and how her life has been affected, you know, while she's waiting on this list. And then we tell you that that little girl is number 11 and we give you the ability to reorder the list. Most people will move her to the top of the list. They'll say, well, mm -hmm. yeah, but it's very different. She's only four years old and you know, she's got such great energy and look at, you know, she's just this great kid. We yeah. need to move her to the top of the list. And then the researchers explain to you, you do know you just killed a kid. Like you just, you just held some other kid's head under the water and had them die in order to bring that little girl to the top. Oh, wow. Okay. You know, but, but we do that. Like we, you know, I, I love to say that all you have to do is, uh, it, you know, is take a picture of a dog and get a Sarah McLachlan song and just play it behind it. And you can raise unlimited amounts of money. Like if you touch the right heartstrings, yeah. you can get people to do things. Was was their decision in moving little girl to the top of the list ethical or moral? Actually, no, because they had to kill somebody else to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but AI wouldn't do that because AI would only look at the statistics. Mm -hmm. It would only look at the probability of success. It would only look at, you know, based upon her age and her weight and, and you know, her current situation and the niacin in her blood and all of these different things, she has the greatest probability of survival. So I will put her to the top of the list and I will take somebody else and move them down that list. Now, we all want to think that sounds really morbid, but in a lot of senses, the outcomes will improve <laughs> because right. yeah. more people will live, but it will suck if you're the person that shows up to get your surgery and they go, uh, no, you gained five pounds since last time you were here. You're not eligible anymore. Yeah. <sighs> you know, that gets tough. But those are decisions that we can't make, mm -hmm. but I believe AI can make. As long as we trust it enough, as long as we understand why it made those decisions and it was based upon quantitative probability and not feelings and emotion and empathy. Does that make sense? A hundred percent. And I love the concept. Like theoretically, I like that concept. But what I struggle with and I would love to hear your opinion on is how do we know? Because like theoretically, uh an unbiased AI that can make decisions that are for the overall good. Number one, like, do we want to really outsource that? Probably you're right. Probably wouldn't improve the quality of like decisions from emotional humans. But mm -hmm. the real question is how can we be sure that that is the case with AI <laughs> and that it hasn't been it, like biases haven't been introduced by, um, by the, the people that have trained it. Sure. Like it's it just so hard for me to ever separate like, the training model was created by a human. Therefore, like something about it is not going to be perfectly unbiased. And I think that that's the unfortunate thing. Like right now we don't, you know, one of the things that we haven't, that human beings have that AIs don't is goals, right? So, so, you know, most of these AI models are being trained, you know, to learn and to strive and to do certain tasks, but what we would have to essentially do there, if we want to think about this from a philosophical perspective, is we would have to set a goal for the AI. And the goal would have to be something that we all agree on. Let's just say it's something like, okay, we have a national budget and we're going to make this really easy. We have a national budget of $100. $6 is dedicated to healthcare. Maximize the most number of people and the most number of potential years in lifespan I think we all, it, it, at least in a, it, it, when we're not referring to ourselves, we could all agree that that sounds pretty good, yeah. right? I want people to live, I want the most people to live as long as possible. And you have $6, Mr. AI, figure it out. I think if we set a goal like that, then 
we might not like the repercussions of what that goal does to us, right? Here yeah. I am. I just turned 50 last Friday and I need to lose about 45 pounds. It could technically just say no more healthcare for this dude. Sorry. Right. You know, I mean, but, but it also could say, here's the six things you could do that will increase your probability. So let's just go back to like the age when people smoked a lot, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we all knew that. But if, if, if your hospital system had said to you, you're not eligible for treatment as a smoker, you're not eligible for treatment, you know, under these things that you can control. And it has to be things you can control. It can't be genetic, yeah. right? Yeah. You, that's the problem is then you get, you get down this rabbit hole. But I think you have to be able to set a goal. You have to be able to set some sort of goal for the AI to work towards and attain and say, I want you to get from point A to point B using these resources in the most efficient way possible. And then my hope would be, that we could we could look at those outcomes in a simulation, some sort of simulation, and we could all get back together and say, you know what? Humanity would be better off. Society would be better off if we agreed that this was a fundamental thing. I think um, ultimately, I don't know. no, I think ultimately that is, this is what's really come to my, uh, this is really what's come to me over the last, just really recently looking at some things that are happening with AI is I believe AI is, an incredibly powerful tool for speeding up human decision making. And, you know, people are like, AI will replace me, blah, blah, blah. Well, like, you know, there's going to be a need to be a human that manages either the inputs or the outputs of the AI and what you do with that. So like, it's not, it doesn't replace anyone. Jobs might change or shift, whatever. Okay. But um, I think AI is a way to augment human decision making and to uh, improve the speed at what we do. A recent study just came out um, the last, last week and I did a podcast on it yesterday where essentially um, there was a super bug that they were finding in hospitals. The World Health Organization deemed it as like highly, you know, negative or, mm -hmm. or um, you know, highly dangerous. There was no solution for it. And they wanted to just, they wanted to create a um, antibiotic for it. As you know, super bugs, they evolve, right? So they yes. can get over certain antibiotics. Anyways, what they did was they trained a model and they gave the model a massive sheet of um, different compounds or a massive list of different compounds. And they said, based off of the genetic makeup of this superbug bug here, uh, what, which of these compounds would be the best? The AI went through like 6,800 different uh, variations and compounds It threw them all against each other. And it, it determined, I think, around 200 um, that it said these are highly likely to work. So then they took those 200 to a lab, manually tested them, came up with nine that they said these nine like all definitely work. They used all nine of them against a mouse with the actual virus. And one of them was better, but I think all of them actually technically worked. One of them was the best and uh, that antibiotic killed it in like killed the, um, the super bug in the mouse and it worked. Okay, so like what would have it had taken to take those 6,800 compounds into a laboratory and test it, like resources wow. and time. So I really believe like it doesn't replace the human and the lab and that whole, you know, scientific process, mm. but it like exponentially, exponentially, you know how long it took them to run through 6,800 compounds? An hour oh, and a half. Oh my goodness, right? Yeah. Doing a lab? Like four <clears throat> it's, days. It's, it's, well, the cost comes way down too. And I think that's the interesting thing because in the end, it's about resources of both time and money. And, yeah. uh, you know, th those are the kind of things I do wonder if, if we could have an AI model that managed something like healthcare, you know, that was able to say at 35 years old, look, you've had your last drink at 36, like, because your probability after that, yeah. or you've, Hey, it's a, you're a smoker. That's fine. If you quit by the time you're 28, here's where your probability <laughs> is. Right. I think we need, sometimes we need those. And listen, I just turned 50 years old. I have lots of buddies who are like, they're overweight. They drink too much. They eat a bunch of red meat. And everybody tells them, oh, you need to do this. You need to do this. You need... It isn't until they have that heart attack. Yeah. And then they yeah. become triathletes after that. They're like, their whole world changes because yeah. they understand the date of the consequence. If you think about Santa Claus, right? All kids know the night that he shows up and their behavior leading up to that night is exceptionally good because yeah. they know what happens on that day. So I, I do hope that we can get there. And I, I do believe that sometimes, you know, older generations – have to not be in control in order for those ideas to come through too. So my hope is that people under maybe the age of, you know, 35 or 40, even if those things don't happen today, 20, 30, 40 years from now, when they truly do run the world, those things will be deeply embedded in their brain to say, you know what, there's a solution that's outside of the existing model. 
And maybe we just need to replace the model with something else and try something different. Yeah. Well, this is what I think would be powerful. And I think this would work for governments and for corporate governance um, for decision making. Imagine if like, let's say here in America, right, we got Republicans, Democrats, conservative, liberal, we have two different Mm -hmm. ideologies, you know, highly contentious. And both have different proposals. They propose different bills. But like put this in a, in a company where you have different departments that are coming up with different mm-hmm. ideas and ways to achieve an objective. Imagine if you could say you could you had like AI model that, uh, you know, had trained for governance or trained for decision making and you feed it in. OK, based off of these inputs, um, like we have X amount of population, X amount of dollars, X amount of people with this issue or that issue. What's the best way we can optimize for this? Um, and then you you have people like create and structure bills or decisions and companies around the outputs of the AI models. And then you transparently show like the population or the employees of the company. Um, this is what we put into the AI model. These are like the variables and, you know, people will contest it like, oh man, you guys are, you know, messing around with these variables. You have yeah. to change this or that. But if you're transparent, right. And people are willing to uh, make mm-hmm. it a, make it an interactive process. Think of how much better decisions could be and how much more objective, uh, theoretically yes they could be right like you could you could say like objectively regardless of your beliefs about anything else this is what we have and this is the outcome we want and this is probably the best way to get there um i think it'd be interesting i, I think that would i be- think it would be too and and so many times listen I, I i love that idea and i think there's a whole episode we could talk just about yeah, that sure. because that is truly you know i'm a systems guy so Every system has inputs, throughputs, outputs, and outcomes. And when we look at government, we don't, you know, we don't a lot of times think about the, those things. We, we don't think about the limitations of the inputs. We don't think about what's the actual outcome we want. We just see some sort of injustice or we believe there's some injustice happening and we're like, well, we need to go fix this. Well, if, if you thought about the whole system and you really said, okay, Yes, you know what? We want we want free medical care for everybody. But here's the dollar amount we're willing to spend. And we're willing to increase that by 2% a year, you know, when we're willing to pay this level of taxes and we're li- what would we get? And what we might get is something that's 80 or 90% there. Mm-hmm. Um and and that could be supplemented by, you know, other things. Uh, so I, I think you're right. I'm, I, I'm hopeful of that. I do believe, I, I know that you're a little bit more apocalyptic when it comes apocalyptic when it comes to AI, as you said in the beginning, I'm optimistic. And maybe this is just being 50 years old and having gone through how many times I heard the sky was going to fall and each and every, I mean, and I saw it with the internet. I remember, I remember, uh, Krugman who's still to this day, somehow he's still, a recognized economist after he said the internet will be no greater than the fax machine. He's like, this thing's a flash in the pan. Forget about it. Right. And the guy still is on CNN. I'm like, how do you, how do you (laughs) say that and still be noted? Right. But, but I've seen this happen many, many times. And what I have found though, is that humans are pretty ingenious in the end, right? We figure out how to utilize that thing to our advantage I do believe that the that the real change that's coming, and I want to spend a couple minutes on this here, as I can't believe we're coming towards the hour mark, which I knew was going to happen. But yeah, I want to spend a couple the minutes. Too you know, good. It is. It is too good, and we need to do it again. So I, I think one of the things we're going to have to think about at some point, and if we dream a little bigger here for a minute, I want you to think about right now. F- one of the fundamentals to our society is work. It has always been fundamental. I don't, you know, when you meet somebody at a networking meeting, what do you say? Well, what do you do for a living? You know, this is a really big thing. And I'm curious if there comes a time where AI, automation, robotics, all these things become so good that that becomes a voluntary part of society, not a mandatory part where we say, you know, we don't need all of the bodies to get these inputs done. Um, and, and maybe we make it optional and we say, look, if you want to be an entrepreneur, if you want to be an artist, if you want to be a writer, if you want to be a musician, do those really cool things. Um, but it isn't necessary anymore because AI has gotten to the point where we don't need as much of that laborious input. Um, I think some people get really offended by that idea. and But I also sit here and say, okay, so what, are, what you're saying is, Instead of going to work every day, I just 
sit around with my family and friends and cook great food and write and listen to music and play with the kids. Like, isn't that what paradise is promised by every religion? Right? Isn't that what we're all trying to attain? What if we could do it here? I just love your thoughts on that. I mean, I don't know if that's 50 or a hundred years from now. I'd, I'd hope it happens in my lifetime, but well, I think okay. There's a Here's the thing. Here's my thoughts on it because this is a really very relevant in AI right now. Sam Altman is like one of the big proponents yeah. of universal basic income. He says yes. part of the solution and he has his uh, world coin, which scans your retinas yep. um, and makes payments through that. My gut reaction to all of this is like, yuck, but that's just me. And I love working and I love doing things and it's exhilarating, you know, podcasting's fun and exhilarating and everyone I feel like has that input. But at the same time, I do know a lot of people that they have jobs that they're doing to survive and it is yes. physically painful and yada, yada. Right. So I get that. Um, okay. So as far as do we achieve that in 10, 50 years, a hundred years, first off, some people have achieved that. So, and, and throughout society that has always, there are people that have that achievement, usually people that either build a big business or are born yeah. into a big business or, you know, royalty, whatever. Like there's people sure. that their existence is whatever they would like to do because yeah. often, sometimes their own work, sometimes the work of someone else. Okay. So then my thought with it and like my vibe is like, I would love to achieve exactly what you've explained. Like that's my goal, right? Um, to, uh, to achieve that. But in my mind, I've always thought of myself as like, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't happen from universal basic income, just magically appearing in my wallet. That happens from me hustling, setting up a system and it runs and does its thing. And now I can spend more time with my friends and family. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs and successful people will say that, but then in reality, so maybe it's a personality thing. Because, and, and I would like to get your, I'll, I'll throw fling this yeah. back to you in a second. Yeah. But um, yeah. in reality, a lot of people that have achieved that, like uh, founders of big companies, they sold for a lot of money. What do they do? Do they stop and like just do their passions and hang out with their family and cook food? Like, no, oh. like the, the CEO of um, Instagram, they sold it to Facebook and they finally exited and they had billion in the bank and they were like, sweet, we're going to go to Hawaii. And they said they went to Hawaii and they sat on the beach for like two weeks and they said, we got really bored and we said, okay, now time to start something new. Like this is what we do. So yes. I almost wonder if driven people will always be driven and push themselves. And like, I don't know if universal basic income happens or um, I don't know if it happens or not, but I don't know. I don't know how relevant it is because I feel like hustlers will hustle and people that can relax may relax. Does it increase our GDP or our outputs for the country? Yeah. Is that a positive or negative thing? Will other countries slow down? Will we become uncompetitive? Those are all the questions you have to be asking, you know? I think you're right, but, but I would tell you, and, and I will agree. Listen, I, I've, I've been involved in a couple of successful exits myself and I have lots of friends that could easily retire. Um, and, and many of them have done that. Many of them have failed at retiring. I think in that, I think for them, they were born builders, right? They're, they're not happy unless they're building something. Yeah. Um, they can't be happy, but I know other people that are really content b being just a cog in the wheel, right? They're just Definitely. like, it's cool, man. Like and I'm they'd probably rather be things. like laid on the couch than even being a cog in the wheel. Exactly. Right. Because ev even if you're laying on the couch, you're still a consumer and you're still yeah. part of the economic equation. You're just a consumer. That's all. That's what, you, what role you have chosen to be. Mm -hmm. You can be a creator. You can be a consumer. And I think if you have a system like universal basic income, it, it allows you maybe even early on as an entrepreneur to take risks that you couldn't take if you didn't have that, if you have to pay the rent. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, you, you can't dedicate yourself to your life's work, which could be philosophy or whatever it is. And I wonder if there's some aspect of our GDP or just the output of the intellectual output of our society that is lost because of that. I also think, you know, I, I don't remember who it was. I think it was Einstein. And they said, what's it like to be the smartest man in the world? And he said, the smartest man in the world is probably digging a ditch somewhere. You know, he's like, it just happens that I was lucky enough to go to the right university, be around the right people. But, but the statistically, the smartest guy in the world is, is at the bottom of a well right now, lifting up buckets of mud. And if we had universal basic income and he didn't have to do that, what could 
she have done with that mind? <laughs> you know, what what changes could she had she had made to our world? What contributions to music and poetry and literature and society or science could have been made if that person would have had that opportunity? I think it's a great ph- philosophical point that you make. I think it's difficult here in the U.S. because we do have the basics, right? But there are lots of places that don't. And mm-hmm. in those places, universal basic income anyway, might, might be way better, right? You might all of a sudden see the GDP change because somebody doesn't have to go slave away in the ditch, can stay at home and comes up with this idea in their think, basement. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. What do you think happens though to um, like national outputs and production? And the, it sounds ridiculous, oh, but the reason I think yeah. about it is because like I'm looking at China right now and uh, the way they're training their kids and like, I don't know if you know this, but like China, TikTok and China are their equivalent. It's not showing yeah, like totally videos different. of like yeah, totally ridiculous yeah. uh, dancing videos and stuff. It's yeah. showing them like science and like all these like productive things. Like I feel like they're going to eat our lunch. Like they're so driven. They're in the top percentile for intelligence. Uh, and their population is massive. And there's other countries too, right? Like obviously Russia invading yeah. Ukraine. And so everyone like Russia is a big <laughs> boogeyman right now. But like with these other countries that are uh, economic competitors to us, what would happen, do you think, to America if there was universal basic income? I know for a fact there's a chunk of people that are going to take that check and just live a life of being a consumer and probably not produce a lot. Does our mm-hmm. Does our country suffer for that. I guess here, here's here's what I would say. If there's one Mark Zuckerberg that's or Elon Musk that's at the bottom of a ditch right now and he wasn't. Like look at the contribution one so, so one person on the bottom drags us down only a very very slight amount. But one person that makes it to the top can lift the whole entire society. A Bill Gates, a, a Nikola Tesla, a mind like that is a terrible thing to waste because if Could you imagine the contributions they might be able to make? And would that, you know, is Mark Zuckerberg worth more than all the poor people in this whole country? Probably. (laughs) Because Elon Musk, right? Their contributions on the upside have been so great. I think it's a philosophical question. I think you can argue it either way. I'm just curious to wonder, you know, is, is there a time where work is not mandatory? And what will we be as a, it's hard to think about because we've, listen, it's, it's sort of like our education model. I've been saying this for a long time. The whole idea of, of students sitting in seats is an idea that Plato came up with 2,500 years ago. We're still using a 2,500 year old model to educate our kids. Maybe the model's just wrong. Like maybe that's yeah. not the way to do it anymore. And I wonder the same thing about work. And I, and I, I think about this a lot. It's like, look, there is coming a time where where we potentially could create a society that doesn't require the physical input anymore and only really looks for the intellectual input. And and if that's the case, interesting, right? What what yeah. does that mean? I, I know don't know. That, that one's so that one is the one thing I feel like on AI so far, and I may just need to do more research that I do feel like has sort of stumped me because I'm not. I'm not hardcore either way. I think like naturally I'm inclined to not like universal basic income or something like that. Um, Just, you know, what I've seen with uh, communism or other countries that haven't been successful with models that arguably or arguably are similar or not similar. But the thing I I do think it is a really important question. I do think this time maybe could be different. But the reason I think it's so important um, as a as a topic is because I, I believe this will happen sooner than we think. I say give our give us five years, and right now everyone's talking about you know how AI is uh, take augmenting right, but eventually maybe replacing a lot of white collar jobs. And they're like, yeah, like I have a lot of so this is like this meme with um a lot of tech founders like myself where they're like, yeah, man, I'm so sick of like all this like advancement in AI. It's like taking over my business. I'm just going to go become an electrician or like a plumber or something, you know. And yeah. uh, it's kind of like the meme, but in reality, I don't think I think give give plumbers and give electricians five years and the Tesla humanoid robot, right? Optimus that they're making and the one that's coming out of Boston Dynamics. Um, those things will have a neural link. Those things will have an AI yeah. chip in their brain. And guess what? You give a plumber a, a, like a skin tight suit that just measures like how his arms are moving. That's how you train those things. You send him to work for one year fixing every plumbing issue he has Yep. And you take the data from that and you do this for like a hundred, you take the data, train it through a neural network. And all of a sudden, like 
this humanoid robot can pretty much do everything an electrician or plumber can do. And like every industry. So in my opinion, it's like sure. white collar, blue collar with the advent of robots, it can all be automated and replaced. And of course you would need, um, you need mass produced cheap electricity. So sure. maybe nuclear or something else like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, well, some of the fusion technology fusion that's on technology, the horizon right now. Yeah. And listen, I came from the electric vehicle industry at fat scooters and you know, the types of batteries that we're using today, lithium ion batteries and stuff like that. I mean, that's like ancient technology. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is like cavemen in the wheel compared to the things that we're doing in the laboratories. Now, the problem right now is those batteries cost a million dollars each, right? Yeah. But once, once we hit that, that economies of scale, you know, using things like fusion, nuclear energy, we can put a battery in a device that can last for years and years and years and can charge from static electricity in the environment. I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that are out there. I, I Jaden, I think it's such an interesting topic because, you know, we're, we're talking about it right now and we're really, you and I both are having a lot of mental barriers with this, but this is what philosophers and, 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 and forward thinkers have to be thinking about right now because it isn't going to happen in the next two or three or four or five years, but it is coming. And, and there, it is coming where a portion of society is going to be displaced to a point where it either becomes the hunger games, <laughs> you know, where it's like you live in the district of people that have nothing. And, and then there's this, this huge divide, or you have to start saying, what is a livable income, right? Something that, that is, it has to be low enough that you're incur if you have any motivation whatsoever, you're going, yeah, I'll take the check, but I'm gonna do something yeah. else. Yeah. But but there are people, and listen, I I love my brother, my younger brother is a great guy. I love him. He he's he's built a business, he built it up to a certain dollar figure, and it's a very, very low dollar figure. And I was like, man, we we can quadruple this. Let me give you the cash. He's like, absolutely not. I, this is exact, this is the lifestyle I want to live. I own my house, I have no, I want to work three days a week, I want to do my thing. I don't want anything else. And I'm like, okay, that's totally fine. Yeah. I'm a little, di you're a little different. Right? So but I, I think even in the education system, if, if we had a system where people didn't, because right now we are training people to be the lowest common denominator yeah. in our education of system. Of if people could specialize, right? Uh, that would be really, if you could specialize, and, and this is what China and some of these countries are doing is getting kids to start spe looking at what they're good at when they're, four, five, six, seven years old and saying, let's, let's devote some energy and time to really developing those skills. I think it's fascinating. I don't, we're not yeah. going to solve it today. <laughs> I know. I know. I wish I could, but it is a thought that, you know, it goes in my mind. It, it's frequent in my mind with every new development that happens and uh, it's tough. And I, I think anyone that tells you they have solved it and have a definite, a definitive answer to it, I would be uh, skeptical of because I think it's going to be a lot of it is going to be played by ear and we're going to have to test it out on a mass scale. The one thing that does give me hope, I guess, or um, sounds so funny. The one thing that I do attribute positively to like a universal basic income scenario or situation is the fact that if you're not making a payment so high that someone quits working, like, you know, let's say everyone's basic food and, and living is like yeah. covered people that are going to want, like no one wants to just be the same as the bottom gets raised, but no one wants to be stuck on the bottom doing nothing. Not no one. Some people don't care, but there is a big portion of the people that would be like, <laughs> sure, this is covered, but like, I want a boat and I want to go on vacation and I want to create this thing or build this shed in my backyard or like advance my life to some point that's more comfortable. And so I think that even if you did have a universal basic income, I don't think it's the end of the world. I don't think it's going to rob everyone of their desire and drive to create um, as long as it's, you know, obviously not just handing out free cash, but, um, and I, yeah. And I think especially if our education system simultaneously changes to not just make you a cog in the wheel, but to say, what are, what are you, what are you the only person in the world that's ever going to think of what, it, you know, is it violin? I mean, is it, is it art? Is it science? Is it cooking? You know, finding those things that people can be passionate about. Cause you're so right. I mean, we both have friends that, you know, they're just not passionate about their life at all. Mm -hmm. Because all it is is just the drudgery of the nine to five and taking that away. I, I'm very passionate about what I do. I love my life. I wouldn't, you know, I, I gave a little speech at my 50th birthday party the other night and they said, you know, do you wish you could be younger? And I said, I, I don't wish I was a second younger than I am right now because I feel like I've acquired all this wisdom in a really hard way. And, and I've been saying this about consulting and it's sort of my joke. I said, I've been consulting for 25 years. And for the last 18 months, I've been doing it right. You know, it took mm. me 23 years of screw ups before I actually got it right. 
but but it would have been nice to be able to focus a little bit more early on, you know, and to the things I had the aptitude of and not have to work, you know, the, the crappy job digging ditches because I did that when I was in high school. You know, I, I think it's, there's an opportunity there. And, and I think it's something we all should be thinking about. It's a philosophical question. And, and listen, I think from, from a social construct perspective, I look at universal basic income and I go, well, that's a bunch of handouts and welfare. Okay, right. maybe I can think about it that way. Let me think about it as something else too. Let me think about it as, you know, uh, I was truly obtaining um, freedom in a society. Let me, let me flip the script on myself and try to convince myself of, of mm-hmm. the, uh, the reverse. But and I think it's really different. important to do that, to steel man the other side of the argument, yeah. because yeah. Um, ultimately we all have like biases and ideological thoughts from the way we were raised, the societies we're in, yeah. and, and even the things we choose, right, to subscribe to. Sure. But not all of them objectively are, you know, the best for every situation or serve us for every, like, right. Like yeah. obviously ever, there's so many different sure. opinions. Obviously they're not all going to be uh, perfect yeah. and correct. And so I do think it's incredibly important if nothing else uh, that we do learn to steel man the other side, we don't shut down debate or discussion on topics. And we, we, we try to um, look at both sides of it. Even, even if we do have biases, like I'll acknowledge I have a lot yeah. of biases about the way I think I things should be run. But um, I, I try to give the other side a fair chance and to look at it because I know everything I believe is not uh, perfect and there's definitely improvements yeah. to be made within it. So I think if we can get closer to a society where everyone does that, AI has a lot more room to grow and improve and, and help people in general. I love it. Jaden Schaefer, how do people find out more about you? How do they subscribe to your podcast? Where do they connect with you at? Yeah. Um, you know, if people have questions, feel free to hit me up on LinkedIn, Jaden Schaefer, or uh, ChatGPT is the name of my podcast. Um, I may have to change the name someday if OpenAI sends me a cease and desist. <laughs> but for now, I'm going to ride it because... Uh, hey, I, I don't blame you. R- ride it until you can't anymore. Jaden, thank you so much for being here. And thank you all for joining us on this edition of The Convergence. We'll see you next time. All right. What an incredible episode with Jaden Schaefer from Chat GPT Podcast. Please make sure you like and subscribe to him. Check him out. He's got a great daily show where he talks about AI and the trends and what is happening right now. I think you will really enjoy it as I do as well. It is one of the sources of information where I get information about AI and how it's going to affect and change the world. Make sure you like and subscribe to this channel and do the same thing for Jaden's channel at ChatGPT. Just go ahead and Google it, look it up on your favorite podcast platform. Give him a like and a follow because it is great stuff. All right, well, until next time. Thanks for listening to The Convergence. If you want more information about the topics you've heard here today, reach out to us at theconvergencepodcast.com.